Mrs. Hume, an inner city area in the Littoral Ward of Manchester, immediately south of the city centre. Once regarded as Manchester's largest and poorest slum, Hume attracted both national and international attention regarding the immense failure of the 1960s regeneration project and has since been used as a learning curve and reminder for future projects. The deck access or streets in the skies was a new and innovating design that intended to not only provide families with quality housing, but also to honour and foster the notion of community. Inevitably, this was not the case. Even Manchester City Council described the architecture as an absolute disaster, it shouldn't have been planned, and it shouldn't have been built. So there's a whole debate about you know why they were built in the way that they were built. Um, and, and I try to summarise what is a complex debate, uh, but at the heart of it, again, it's finance, it's money. That there isn't sufficient money to build high, higher standard working class housing, particularly ones that will house a relatively large number of people. In less than a generation, the area was transformed from Victorian slum terraces to Western Europe's largest deck access estate and back again. By the end of the 70s, the estate had already become a byword for failure, worse, the inhumanity of 60s mass public housing. This raises the question, where did it all go wrong and why? Does the blame lay with central government, whose funding was limited? Was it the physical or social fabric that failed first? What was to be expected when rebuilding a community arguably from scratch? Or was it as a result of second-class citizenship that ultimately pushed the community to rebel and to take back ownership of Hume? Let's go back to the 19th century, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution where Hume's housing issues began. This age took Manchester by surprise, a shock city that rapidly emerged to be the powerhouse of the industrial age. Naturally, as the economy boomed, it brought with it an influx of workers to the city. Between 1771 and 1831, the population significantly increased to six times than that of before, a level that the city was drastically unprepared for. Hume, which grew dramatically in the first half of the 19th century, particularly in the second quarter of the 19th century, by 1851 there were over 50,000 people living in Hume which, had it been a separate town, would have made it certainly into one of the top 30 towns in the whole country, except it was just part of Manchester, which itself was also growing quite quickly. But the houses were new, as you'd expect, and many of them actually were built to a reasonably high standard, so that in fact, in terms of work, the working classes, people, working class families aspired to live in Hume. Gradually, as the city grew, so did Hume, and due to the lack of regulations and housing laws in this period, the new terraces were erected in a jumbled pattern and had no regard for municipal boundaries. Subsequently, this marked the beginning of Hume's fate, a heavy price for paving the way of the Industrial Revolution. They lived in a, a, an impoverished area with nothing but really loved life, and enjoyed life, looked out for each other, gave everything to each other, sugar, give a bit of bread, fed your children, done, everyone did it for each other, hundreds and hundreds of people, loved each other, trusted each other. When you tried to describe Hume, say, by the middle of the 19th century, it was really a residential district, largely for the working classes, a very small number of middle class people, families that had moved into Hume. Uh, realised they'd made a mistake and they were moving out because it becomes so much associated with, with the working class. As a result of these squalid conditions, Hume was soon branded one of Manchester's worst slums, occasionally ravaged by outbreaks of cholera and other diseases associated with unsanitary conditions. At the end of the Second World War, Britain faced a huge housing crisis. We'd lost a lot of housing stock as a result of the war. What was left was deemed as totally unfit, and a lot of it was. I mean, a lot of what they replaced was not lovely little terrace houses. These, the things they were placing, had no bathrooms. And these were very. They used to have bath houses at the end of the road, so they weren't replacing prime, nice properties. The housing shortage unsettled local governments, especially in conjunction with a rapidly increasing baby boom of population, ever more becoming unhappy with the pre-war and wartime housing. 
1945, the Manchester Corporation published the Long-Term Development Plan, which defined the current housing stock in Hume as endless rows of grimy houses, no gardens, no parks, no community buildings, and no hope. Nonetheless, it became clear that the solution would have to include clearing the existing housing stock and rebuilding. And so, the mass slum clearance commenced to make way for the new modernised high-rise and deck access. Step by step, as the old slums are pulled down, we are going to build houses for families with children, as well as building flats for those who prefer them. All the small industries that litter up Hume today will go to areas reserved for them elsewhere. Main roads we'll keep out of the way, where they won't be a danger. But to do this, and this is the point, we shall have to reduce the population step by step to 27,000. So two-thirds of the people will have to move elsewhere to give the remainder a chance to breathe. But was simply rebuilding Hume enough to make a functional society? What about the people whose lives it would affect? How would a community be rebuilt from only concrete and metal? By the early 1960s, all remaining terraced houses in Hume were demolished, with only a few buildings spared. This was the beginning of the new Hume. They were in these rolls of houses before where they depend, you know, where toilets were out the back of the garden, which is a nightmare. Imagine needing to piss at half eleven at night and then having to go out in the freezing cold with what the full length of your garden and sit in a shed. So someone had to make a big change on that, and that was really the development when they, when they built the new Hume in the late sixties. And but you know they don't they don't really care for the people and the effects of it. When when you knock down an area and you're, you're in your teens and they knock down a huge area and you know you can quite easily adapt to what's going to happen but when you're in your 70s and you've lived somewhere for 70 years and they're going to knock it all down it, it kills you regeneration can kill you, and it, and it, you of course once you demolished a slum you then left with the question of well, where were the people who lived in the slum going to live in other words where were the houses going to come from i lived in hume when i was a kid we could just roam around Stretford Road where all the shops were. They went from All Saints Park right up to Stretford. I never heard of any muggins or anything before the redevelopment. It's only this. Most families were moved out of the Almost Side and surrounding districts into Hume around 1972, I think. That's when we moved in, I, I remember. The old back-to-back -back houses, although some were grand in design, were all demolished and mountains of rock and rubble took their place, you know? In hindsight, the mass clearance of the slum terraces was arguably the completely wrong approach to urban regeneration, as this focused purely on the physical improvement of the area, rather than concentrating on the more complicated matter of engaging and developing the whole community. Yeah, I think it was really an attempt to house a lot of people cheaply and easily rather than for the community. There was also government support for system building so there were a lot of them were untried building techniques and technologies that they were also using at the same time so they were untried uh, habitat ideas and they were untried um, construction and, and materials uh, ideas uh, being done at pace to deliver rapid change and I suppose at first people were thrilled. So what you were replacing it seemed on paper a lot better what it hadn't taken account was that you can move the housing stock on but people hadn't moved on. They were used to having their little house with their neighbours and the front doorstep and trying to sort of put all that up in the air and tell them this is the future wasn't going to work. Coupled with the fact what was built was built to a budget in a hurry and they, they were prone, they were crumbling. I mean, they, they weren't well made. Did the planners anticipate that a large number of problem families were to be housed in a concentrated area? It's very unforgiving. Um, if it was occupied by 
<coughs> relatively wealthy, <coughs> economically active um, people who <coughs> understood that and engage with that way of living, then it could be hugely successful. It was colossal, so it's difficult to imagine putting that number of that type of people in one location. When they opened all that deck access crescent area in the 70s and the late 60s, from what I, from what I understand, even being possibly from one myself, is that they, they did put a lot of problem families from other parts of Manchester into Hume at that time. There was a lot of asylums empty and a lot of mental health people went there at the time to, to, to get cheap residency because it wasn't long after they opened it they realised it was a nightmare. No cop was going to dare walk up the stairs on his own in the dark. Just, it's, it was a great example of town planners thinking this is what we need to design. We designed this, this is for the future, but they just didn't take into the, the needs of the people they're trying to move into them. I mentioned to you about Tom Bloxham converting India House into flats. And I think as far as that, that was the first thing I was aware of, that somebody took a piece of derelict Manchester and tried to make something of it. And that was really successful. And so everybody else thought, that's a good idea. I'll buy an old mill and I'll convert it into flats. And so he started getting lots of people living in the city centre for a change, because there was hardly anybody living in the city centre before that. Um, and so you've got people living in the city centre, so more cafes and bars open. No, so it's totally different to raising an area and rebuilding it again. Many architects and planners agree that the design philosophy behind the Crescent was completely unsuitable to Manchester's climate. It's, uh, it's a Mediterranean model, really, which um, with beautiful sunlight and, and um, temperatures uh, and dry climate that you can get uh, in the Mediterranean and it's a very it's a very livable offer but um, it's 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 a model that doesn't transport very well to um, a kind of um, cold wet uh, gloomy northern hemisphere uh, kind of location the Hume Crescent at the time was all new and fresh to us, and big, and as young teens, a great adventure. To the adults, it met with some apprehension, but inside the flats are quite modern for its time. The defects came later, and other problems of living in blocks of rocks followed. With the model of these new deck access homes proving unsuitable for the Hume area, the redevelopment also lacked in providing the residents with communal opportunities something which is considered highly important in today's regeneration schemes. The deck access thing, I think a lot of people thought that was a good idea uh, and you'd actually meet your neighbours, uh, whereas if you say if you lived in a tower block and uh, you could live there for years and never bump into anybody else, you just come out your front door, go in the lift, um, whereas if everywhere is accessed by a walkway, basically a street in the sky, you are going to bump into people all the time. But there was no, there was hardly any facilities around. Um, there was big green spaces, but they were, there was no planning to them, there was no form to them, there was just open spaces. There was no football pitches or sports facilities. Or, there was one pub in the middle. In many cases, the Hume people were left to find their own means to pass the time. For a teen growing up in Hume during the regeneration, life was an adventure, surviving through the concrete jungle.
one of my other favourite times is the Crescents were all built with garages below. But most people couldn't afford cars in the early 70s, or so we were just learning to drive, you know? So we as teens made many dens out of them into garages. Sometimes having three or five dens where we went, you know? Sometimes having our own. We went through phases. There were many empty garages under the flats, or so it seemed, and we also had a few running battles with Stratford gangs and stick battles and other, air, other postcode areas, but nothing like it was in the 90s. We, always practic we also practiced our Kung Fu moves down there, what we learned from movies. Um, teen life in the 70s was cool at times, you know, it seemed like sunshine, but it was still rough. And we created our own fun mostly. Yeah, as children, youths, created our own. The Crescents were named after their creators, as at the time of construction, they were truly something to marvel at. And so, the four giants went by the names of Robert Adam Crescent, Charles Barry Crescent, William Kent Crescent, and John Nash Crescent. One of my favourite memories was I lived slap bang in the middle of Robert Adams, one of the big crescents. I lived on the third floor, looking over the big circle or ball ring, as we wish to call it. It was our collective play then for all the big crescent kids. And many who came from other areas of you, I suppose. We had many great moments in that big circle ball ring. Chopper bite races, football, cricket, rounders, stone battles, girl boiling cups, talking, meeting what was going down on the estates, all sorts of things. A great, great, good, bad, ugly, everything went down there. It was a meeting point for many, an adventure, both good and bad. And beautiful, I should say. If someone had a dog back in the 70s or even the 80s, an Alsatian, which they did because they wanted something meaty to protect them, if they left it outside their fucking front room door and you walk past and you've got to go to the house on the other side of the dog, you had to walk back down the stairs and all the way across and up again because it was so fucking frightening. <laughs> and that was all over Hume as well. There was deck accesses all over and you'd walk. I, do, I did a paper round in 1986, so I did the big tower blocked horn church, but I did all the deck accesses and when I was walking around, um, I remember just getting up these stairs on the third floor and then I took a right and there he was just all station like looking at me and thought, fuck, I've got to walk past him. But when I get to that house, I'm just going to actually literally move to the left and stand, pretending that he's not there, which makes you just look like a complete goon. He's going to attack you. So I walk down the stairs and underneath and up and there's the times when they do attack you and then you think, right, I'm giving up a paper round. But then you've got to think about who else is on the stairs, you know. In their early life, the architecture actually won several design awards and introduced technologies such as underfloor heating to the masses. Nice, but as irony has it, now later in life I'm involved in property. And um, I mean, John Nash himself, if he'd known that building was named after, <laughs> leading <laughs> architect, great. he would have spun his they were They were badly made. The designs, they didn't allow, they, what they were replacing was lots of terraced houses which had had this back street community where people would be over talking to each other in the backyards and so forth. They were trying to do a good thing. They thought they could improve people's lives using these new materials, yeah. new, new concepts of heating systems, but the people who designed it never understood who would actually be living there. I mean, when they were first opened, of course, people applauded them and thought, you know, well, this was, this was a fantastic improvement. It was only, of course, when it began began to be clear, of course, that, well, first of all, they were extremely cold and they were very expensive to heat, mm. uh, that you began to see that there were structural, serious structural problems with the design. Um, though, of course, that design had come about because there wasn't sufficient money to build, if you like, more typical houses, working class houses, Houses for the working class at that at, the, at that time. So you know, here was a relatively economic solution to providing a large number. The way it was built uh, meant that there was ever an explosion there. Um, it was because because it was a semicircular building. It was kind of under tension. So an explosion in the middle would just fling stuff everywhere. Uh, so there was no gas 
and it was all electric heating, electric cooking and electricity. That was a, in those days, that was a very expensive way of heating and cooking. Um, so a lot of families struggled to afford to live there. And Just two years after their opening, the housing scheme was deemed to be unsuitable for families due to the ever-growing defects with the design. My brother went to live in the Crescent. He had four children and boy were the passages filthy. The smell of urine. They were poorly built and very daunting to walk around in the night. It never used to be like that. You just felt safe. They made a right mess of things. Nobody knew anyone anymore. All the old Hume people were either moved to Partington or within shore. Serious design flaws such as thick concrete balconies prevented residents from seeing one another. But on more serious matters, the turning point that set the plans in motion to remove families was the tragic yet eye-opening event of a child falling to their death in 1974. We were all mainly families, you know. We never knew of the dangers to come. Fan assisted central eating, asbestos scares, children climbing and falling to their deaths, you know, on the air rises. A lot of things went on, you know. The long list of failures gave the Crescent's national attention. In 1975, just three years after opening, a survey was conducted which found 96.3% of residents wanting to leave the Crescent's and be rehoused elsewhere. There were dumps, but the planners didn't have to live there. They went home to their nice suburbs. The local authorities had taken out of Hume. If you look at that 1968 film, even by then, they were beginning to take out of Hume who were vulnerable families, uh, the more respectable families were moving out anyway of their own free will. They saw that it was a disaster. And in many ways, it seemed as if the council and police had abandoned hope for the Crescents, and indeed Hume. Hume, the older people. 1981 after the Moss Side riots, there was a lot of heroin use in Hume. So Hume, in its own impoverished right way, it had all the flats, it had its little boozers, it was only a pound a pint, people were in them all day long. And coming and going and you know being tipped, you're not drunk and violent, but then in the evenings at night time there could be incidents and this was when it was all families. There was hard families, there was tough families, there was families causing trouble, there was bullying families, there was good people, shit people, um, thieves, um, it was everything but it was community. You know, as the new recruits of you, the Fresh Blocks, we saw it all unfold before the later madness kicked in across Manchester, you know, the Gunchester every so often. The, the Crescents were starting to crumble and into stations in some places. Towards the end, they were abandoned by the council. Yeah, you're right. There's much truth, and it took us down in different ways to the people of Hume and my side. But we all feel it collectively, and as Bob Marley sang, who feels it knows it. The decision that the high-rise and crescent living was not suited for family environment led to new types of tenants moving in. Uh, we ended up in the crescents because they were very cheap, affordable homes. But the, the actual the, the university were pushing students towards, particularly second and third year students, which had very, very limited student accommodation to Manchester. Um, and yeah, they're an interesting place. A very singular community. Um, untroubled by things like laws and police and, and um, so it was a community sort of largely run by itself and, and you know, everything generally went by the rule like treat other people like you want to be treated and <clears throat> you go around sticking guns in people's faces it's going to happen to you at some point. Not only were the materials failing to provide a home for the people, but certain aspects of the design made it difficult to provide proper maintenance. As it was, in its own right, a kind of planet Hume, or um, I don't know. It was just, it was just this underground utopia. We we're all outside doing what we want. We weren't doing things that were causing people problems. There was gangsters, and there was gunmen, and there was all this other shit that was going on with the drug dealing trade of. South Manchester on the streets of Hume and it was it was dangerous at times for people 
and especially women in the early 90s was very vulnerable late 80s and all there was quite a few rapes going on there but again I don't police the area and I hate every story that I hear that's negative like that. It wasn't always perfect conditions in Hume, you know, we created our own adventures and leisure time which often led to trouble through boredom or just wanting to grow up too fast I suppose. Living on the estate, estate life, you know, it's not easy for many. It makes a person want to go out forever, take chances in many cases anyway. I sailed the world and saw very much as a young teen sailor when I left school. I was fortunate to get out, but then came back to the 81 madness and the poverty and the craziness of the UK. You know, lost my job, unemployment, some kid kicked me in the docks closed down, factories closed down. That's what was going on up north. When you take the backbone away from a community, it falls apart. And that's what was happening. With all this in mind, ask yourself, would Hume's story be different if the decision making for the scheme was entrusted to local authorities and residents, opposed to the central government making decisions for communities without the latter being consulted? There was no integration of the community into the replacement product. The 1990s one, through all the kind of studies that had gone on previously uh, over the previous kind of three decades, had understood the failure this approach to, to local communities. It's always important to get feedback from residents, but you know, the councils, I don't know. Although not always what we want to seem to happen, as in the mass, in the case of the mass redevelopment across the UK in major cities in the 70s, I doubt any community had a say in that much at the time. This raises an important question. Was second-class citizenship in Hume a major contributor to the failure of the regeneration project? There wasn't any longer any employment in Hume. Uh, and I'm sure if you had Hume as your postcode, uh, it was not something, if you were sensible, you'd tell people. If you told your employer you came from Hume, you were classed a low life. Everybody abandoned the Hume people. There was tension as well. In some parts, as crime was rising and people were being aware, plus the hatred of the police system, because they were very racial at the time, and in some cases still are. You know, we had the sus laws and many other things. We were starting to rebel, and as we grew, so did the bad conditions as well. Many homes were well kept, though, and looked after by the families. It was the cost of living and crime, which is a black mark in society, especially in the Moss Side and Hume areas. You know, poverty-stricken areas always been the case, from Land's End to Jenna Groats, I suppose. Did this ultimately push the community to rebel against the authorities in a stand against austerity and the outdated class divide system? By 1984, the Crescents had become so undesired by prospective residents that Manchester City Council stopped charging rents entirely. It was an experience, but it did have, there was very much, within Hume, was a very strong community sense. Very different people, total different subcultures, and for at least a time, they coexisted remarkably well <laughs> together. In, an, in, in almost a self-regulating environment, very little authority input, and it did work in its own weird way. You, you, you branded in some way. Yeah. We lived by all sorts of stereotypes and that, but you know, Hume, unfortunately, as I say, developed this image as a very rough community. Um, and to, you know, and there was behaviour to support that. In summary, during the 1960s, Hume suffered some of the most shattering changes a community could ever have imposed upon it. The younger generation loved the kind of range in freedom of it because it was very under-occupied. They just loved the sense of the alternative uh, nature that, that was there. The older community felt rooted in that place because um, they'd lived there, they'd got memories, their family, families had grown up and the neighbor, they knew their neighbours and um, 
they, 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 they don't take change very easily and they certainly don't want to be helicoptered out to somewhere else necessarily. So um, working with that community to uh, fulfill their kind of aspirations, which were very broad, um, was a, a major task and the city put forward a it seconded agents from, from, from various departments in the city. It set up a board down in Hume. And um, that board had on it members of the community to um, sit in the process of designing and developing. In 1994, when Utter Carnage swept through Hume, it was decided that the area was to undergo a second regeneration and that a blank canvas was needed in order to revive Hume to its former glory. Subsequently, this began with the demolition of the Crescents, just 17 years after their opening. This raises the question as to what policies were changed when rethinking the design for the second regeneration. If that particular type of architecture had been um, occupied by choice through demand and it had been well managed by a stakeholder group that were probably the residents themselves, it, it's arguable that, that it may work, and there are examples of it elsewhere where it, it works. Um, but fundamentally, it's quite an alien product to ask a family with growing children to occupy and find a way of living within it and uh, and therefore you'd have to argue that there are better models than that and, and, and our model was based on um, a very a very straightforward uh, understanding of, of, of home and place and uh, recognizable uh, neighborhoods uh, with your own private a grade amenity space and a very clear definition between public and private. None of those were in um, the product that, that uh, replaced uh, the, the, the traditional brick housing. The sad truth of second class citizenship limited many residents from escaping the poverty and deprivation. Today, the old buildings of Hume have been demolished and replaced by modern residential housing, almost unrecognisable to some. But one thing that stands out the most, beyond all the history of redevelopments and anarchy in the area, is the strength of the residents and their ability to survive.